Have you ever considered where the devil might start if he wanted to pollute the spiritual power in your life? What fundamental attack could he make that would automatically corrupt the true power of godliness and turn it into a mere form? Join me today on Windows of Hope as we study one of the greatest religious deceptions of all time. Welcome to Windows of Hope. Today we have a very special family with us here, the Steffens family. They recently joined Quiet Hour and Share Him on a short-term mission trip to Cusco, Peru. Welcome, Steffens family. Thank it's you. It's nice to have you here. I'm going to be talking with Dr. Randy and Linda about what that trip was all about. I hope you'll join us for a window on missions. Welcome to Randy and Linda Steffens. It's so nice to have you here with me, and we're going to talk a little bit about something that we did together about a year ago. We were down in the country of Cusco, Peru. Now, Randy, did you take your whole family? Every single one, from 22 down to 12. And Linda, what did the kids do? Well, all of the kids were involved. Um, my two oldest ended up both preaching. And my two younger children both taught children's meetings. Really? Yes, and they all worked in the clinic also. Yes, they were very busy all day, weren't they? Yes, and they night. Were. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So, Randy, what made you decide to take a vacation to a country like Cusco, Peru, instead of going to Hawaii or Disneyland? <laughs> As a physician, it's something that uh, me and my wife have always wanted to do. Um, and in fact, that's why we get in. Uh, many of us get into medicine so that we can go out and we can help others. And and um, and then if we can combine that with a spiritual application, it makes it all the better. And so this was a good opportunity to do that in a great place, and it sounded like a good thing to do. Now, when you start talking about going on a mission trip, Linda, how did your children react? Well, we this is the fifth mission trip that we've taken with our children, okay. and so whenever we mention mission trip, everyone gets excited because everyone in the family loves to go on mission trips. Well, awesome. Now, Randy, how old were the boys when they first preached a sermon? Randy, our oldest, was 19, and Robbie, our second, was 16. And they did that in Guadalupe and um, several years ago. And uh, at that point, we were a little bit nervous. We knew that Randy would do fine, but we were kind of nervous about what Robbie might do since it was his very first experience. And uh, he ended up doing a fantastic job, and it really encouraged us all to keep on doing it. Awesome. Now, you have younger children that are coming on. Yes. Have they expressed a desire to do any preaching? Well, um, since they've both had opportunity to teach in the children's departments, they, we basically go through a evangelistic series for children with the younger um, set. So I would say that uh, they're, they're learning um, in that manner, and maybe in the future... Brandon has expressed an interest in preaching a series himself for the adults. Awesome, awesome. Now, Randy, what kind of an experience has this done for your children? What has this experience done for them personally? Uh, it's given them an opportunity to participate in a medical experience, uh, which, which is really good. In fact, uh, we're looking forward to doing it again where we can get them even more involved. My goal next time is to get them involved directly in more patient care and even pulling teeth and doing as much as they can, they can do in that setting. And realistically, they can do a whole lot more. And if I had known everything that would have been available in Cusco, we would have um, had them do far more than what they did. But it was, it was great for what they were able to do at that time. Linda, how has it affected them spiritually? Oh, I think it's very important. I think when a young person can actually go and um, witness for the Lord themselves, um, it does something for their own their own heart and their own spirituality. And as they're preaching every night or teaching the children, you know, it's difficult to teach something or preach something unless you've already learned it yourselves. It, it internalizes it much more, I believe. What about the conditions in some of these third world countries? 
uh, what is, how has that affected the kids? They recognize that there's a whole world out there that's far different than what they've grown up with, and it gives them a greater appreciation for, for the real world, a greater appreciation for, for what they have, and a, um, a desire to, to do more for others because they recognize that the Lord doesn't give just to one and, and not give to another, and those that have something need to be able to give to others to help them. It does give us a greater sense of responsibility, doesn't it, mm -hmm. for what we are blessed with here mm -hmm. in North America. That's yes. true. Now, I know that you went there to share the gospel. That was your primary focus. But you did get to do a little side trip as well. Mm -hmm. And so families can have some fun, can't they, too? Mm -hmm. What did you do, Randy, while you were in Cusco? Well, we went to Machu Picchu, which was uh, a real extravaganza by itself. The mm -hmm. train ride there was, was great. The kids loved it. Uh, going to Machu Picchu was, was very, very interesting, getting to see a part of the world that they otherwise would have never been able to do. It's, it is uh, the um, uh, South American equivalent to Egypt. Well, you know, I wish sometimes that I had had the opportunity when I was taking geography back in grade school to do some of these wonderful trips that the young people are experiencing right now. What an education for them. Um, I, that's awesome. But I still think that the spiritual and the uh, caring that they experience cannot be matched with anything else that they might do in this life. Yeah, awesome. Yeah. Now, do you plan to go on another mission trip? Definitely. <laughs> soon? Uh, as soon as we're able, as soon as um, everything works out. Good, good. Mm -hmm. And what would you suggest, Randy, to families who are thinking about planning their vacation? Coming up here, it's going to be summertime soon. What would you recommend they do? Well, they have a choice. They can go do something frivolous and spend their money and come away with uh, children that don't have any further developed character. Or they can go do a mission trip where they still have a very good time. Uh, and it will teach them to develop their interests in a broader array in the real world. Uh, they will be able to develop their, their talents in speaking. They'll be able to, if they do a, mission, uh, a medical mission trip, they can develop uh, medical talents. And, uh, and if they have a desire along those lines, they can gain skills in that area. Awesome. I think that's so exciting. Mm -hmm. I am so happy that families like yourselves have made the choice to do this. And what a blessing you were to our group to have your family and other families with young children and teenagers to participate. Um, it was a blessing to them as well as to the people that we went to serve. And I think the opportunity of young people experiencing different professions, careers, participating hands-on gives them a lot better idea of what they want to do with a career choice of their own. And uh, the best bonus is leading souls to Jesus and Amen. seeing mm -hmm. what happens when we give the chance to preach the gospel and then see what people do to respond to it. Yes. It's awesome. Thank you so much for being with us today. It's been a privilege and a pleasure to meet your family and to uh, reunite after mm -hmm. a few months. Very much. Thank so you. thank you for sharing and we hope a lot of families will do this very thing in the near future. We do as well. Yes, thank you. Blessings. It's the biggest selling toy in the history of the world. In May 2010, the Rubik's Cube, invented by Hungarian professor Erno Rubik, celebrated its 30-year anniversary with more than 350 million units sold throughout those three decades. If someone were to make just a single turn of one of the cube's faces every second, it would take 1,400 million million years to go through all the possible configurations. More than 43 quintillion different patterns can be displayed, but only one is the correct solution. I was fascinated by such staggering room for error. 43 quintillion ways to get it wrong, and only one way to do it right. But it's the same way in the life of a Christian. There are countless motives and methods for pursuing and living out a spiritual life, but only one of them is right. Jesus called that right way the narrow gate, and his warning is both staggering and sobering. Read with me here in Matthew chapter 7, 
verses 13 and 14. Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Nearly 300 years ago, the great preacher John Wesley wrote, There is only one way of keeping the commandment, but there are a thousand ways of breaking every commandment. That sounds somewhat like this Rubik's Cube. More than 43 quintillion wrong configurations possible, but only one right way. Here's how John Wesley lists some of the wrong ways to pursue a walk with God. Add those who have a fair name but are not alive to God. They appear outwardly alive, but are inwardly full of uncleanness, full of pride or vanity, of anger or revenge of ambition or covetousness. They love themselves and the world's pleasures more than they love God. They are highly esteemed of men and women, but they are an abomination to God. He's saying that their outward appearance looks just fine, but inside the motives that drive their actions are all wrong. And John Wesley continues, At all those who have something of the form of godliness, but nothing of its power. They have not submitted to the righteousness which is of God by faith. He's again observing that the appearance of spirituality, the form of godliness, is there. But there's no inward power, no heart surrender to a life of righteousness by faith in God. Notice how John Wesley narrows the focus to two elements, motive and method. Motive, the state of the inward heart, not the outward appearance of a religious lifestyle and method, relying on the righteousness of God which comes by faith. The Rubik's Cube offers more than 43 quintillion wrong configurations, but only one way is right. A spiritual life can be built on countless wrong motives and methods, but only one motive and only one method is right. The motive and method are so foundational, so integral to finding the only right way, which Satan, our enemy and the father of lies, has focused on deceiving us about motive and method in any way he can. Satan's deceptions about these two crucial aspects can perhaps rightfully be considered the greatest religious hoax in the history of the world. What is this core truth about method and motive that he works so diligently to neutralize. Read with me in Luke chapter 10, verse 25, these words. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? The man is asking Jesus for the one right way. Jesus answered with a question continuing in verses 26 to 28. What is written in the law? He replied, How do you read it? He answered, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. The scope of this commandment is simply astounding. Love God with all your heart, soul, strength and mind. And while you're at it, love your neighbor too. Be as concerned for him as you are for yourself as protective of his needs and interests as you are for your own. There's our method, and what a method it is. The one right way is complete love for God and complete love for others. Nothing held back and reserved, no protection of self-interest, no cultivation of personal desire, individual pleasure with ourselves as primary focus. It's all for God, plus looking out for others equally with ourselves. And think also of how Satan attempts to deceive us about this. One extremely effective way is to dilute the impact of the word all. Satan would like us to read the verse more like this. Love the Lord your God with some of your heart, some of the time. Don't become too extreme. Take care not to appear passionate about God in an unseemly way. Maintain a proper balance, a calm and reasonable affection displayed at appropriate times. 
Or perhaps he would like us to view the command like this. Love the Lord your God with some of your strength. A nice portion of strength, of course, but a portion that can be set aside without distracting from the strength you'll need in order to focus on working. So you'll be able to get lots of money. So you'll be able to buy lots of things. And don't forget to allow for the strength you'll need to keep in reserve in order to enjoy the things you'll buy. In other words, spread your strength in a reasonable fashion between the priorities of God and the priorities of the world that you live in. It's not really serving two masters. It's just part of living in the real world. You say, Satan wants us to consider all the many possible configurations, the differing percentages of split affections. The possibilities are endless, and they're all wrong. The one and only right way is to give all of our love to God alone. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 2, verses 2 and 3. God is speaking to the angel of the church at Ephesus. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked men, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles, but are not, and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. This Ephesus church sounds wonderfully sincerely committed. They persisted with courage, kept going even when it was very hard. They don't tolerate evil, and they love truthful teaching and doctrine. They have patiently suffered for the cause of God. Many of you right now may be thinking along with me that sadly, these descriptions cannot be applied as fully to us as they are the Ephesus church. We know there are too many ways we fall short of their wonderful example of faithful obedience and patient commitment. But even with all these wonderful qualities, this church lacks something vital. God's message to Ephesus continues in verse 4. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken your first love. One of the great religious hoaxes of Satan is to divert our focus from total, complete, passionate love for God. The great love chapter of 1 Corinthians 13 tells us that we can give everything we have to the poor and be martyred in the name of Christ. But without the motive of love, we're still not on the narrow way. We've just found two more of the many possible wrong ways. What does the motive of true love look like in action? Let's go to 1 Corinthians 13. Verses 4 and 5 tells us this. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. This is getting impossibly hard. Our motive is to be an all-encompassing love for God. Total commitment. Plus, we're to be patient, kind, humble, and keep no record of wrongs. Remember, these words aren't meant to cover just those who treat us nicely and make it easy for us to feel warmly toward them and be naturally kind and patient in return. In fact, Jesus says this in Matthew 5, verses 43 and verse 44. You have heard that it was said, Love your neighbor and hate your enemy." But I tell you, love your enemies. Again, the great deceiver Satan wants us to feel that it's okay to water this command down in our minds. He tries to somehow convince us that this is too hard. It just goes too far. God doesn't truly mean we're to be patient, kind, and humbly serving to those who are going to take advantage of us, does he? He can't possibly mean that kind of love, that sort of sacrifice. It's just too extreme. The great religious hoax of Satan is to dilute in our minds, however, possible the absolute fullness of love God requires, the complete commitment of every thought, action, and desire to Him, plus the complete service to everyone around us, complete, all, all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and our neighbor as ourselves. This is only the right motive, and it is impossible to achieve through our own willpower, choice or effort. The one right way, 
the one right motive. The only hope we have is found in John 15, verses 4 and 5. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Only in constant connection to Jesus do we find our heart, our motives reprogrammed and changed from selfishness to complete love for God and others. When Professor Erno Rubik was asked what made his toy so fascinating and appealing, he replied, It's simple, but it's complex. It's easy to understand, but it takes dedication and patience to work it out. More than 43 quintillion different configurations, but only one right way to solve the puzzle. Satan offers the great hoax of a broad, easy road to destruction, filled with multiple deceptions and diversions. And there's only one right and narrow way to truth, simple but complex, easy to understand, but requiring dedication and patience to work it out. How about you, friend? Are you willing to do it for Him today? Let us pray. Father, help us to remain connected to the vine. Show us how to change our self-focus so that we can truly love the Lord our God with all of our hearts and love our neighbors as ourselves. In the precious name of Jesus, I pray. Amen.
It's always a blessing to hear messages of hope from God's Word. These messages give us hope, which is something many people today just don't seem to have. But we are assured in the Bible that Jesus is coming again and that the entire universe is under His command and, above all, that He loves each and every one of us as His own child. It's good to focus our minds on such hopeful promises. That's why we'd like to offer you Signs of Hope, a wonderful little book by Alejandro Bullon completely free of charge. It discusses issues in our world today and how they point us to the soon return of our Redeemer. Your mind will be lifted heavenward as you see the signs that Jesus will come back soon to take us home. Windows of Hope is a ministry supported entirely by our viewers. Your faithful gifts to this ministry are greatly appreciated. To make a donation, simply mail a check, give us a call, or you can even donate online. Thank you for your support. To order today's offer, call us toll-free at 1-800-379-7171 or write us at Quiet Hour Ministries, P.O. Box 3000, Redlands, California, 92373. Our viewers in Canada can write to Quiet Hour Ministries, P.O. Box 22085, St. Thomas, Ontario, N5R 6A1. Let's determine to not be deceived by Satan's hoax. He will try to convince that the broad way is best. Remember that the narrow way leads to truth. Send us your prayer request and join us again next week for Windows of Hope.